let me put you down here. Uh, say hi to the people. Hi. And tell them how old you are. Two. He's two and a half years old, which is exactly how long it's been since I touched my any cubic castle here. So it's about time I finished this build. Uh, when last we left it, I was talking about putting these magnetic uh, rods onto the printer. So let's actually do that right now. Are you dancing with your batons? Yeah. Okay, cool. You're a crazy kiddo, did you know it? Crazy! There hasn't been a lot of uh, innovation or iterations uh, with Delta printers in the last two and a half years. So uh, actually the, the videos that I made back then about this printer are still completely relevant today. Uh, I'll put a playlist to those videos in the description. But uh, let's go quickly over some of the issues. So first of all, this is the original motion system right here. And you can see it's just these uh, plastic Delrin pulleys riding in the grooves of the extrusion. So this is the same technique that all of the Creality printers are using. And it was the original technique on these uh, Cossel printers. And actually, I think it was superior to the high win, or no, they're not genuine high win rails, to the knockoff Chinese uh, linear rails. Now, in theory, linear motion rails are superior, and that's why if you get an AnyCubic console today, it will come with these motion rails. But the problem that I'm having is um, there's wiggle. There is slop there. So the tolerance, I don't know if it's in the bearings in the bearing blocks or if it's in the Highland rails, how they've been ground. Whatever it is, the tolerance isn't there, and there's wiggle. So that's not good. A little bit of wiggle uh, can have a, a big consequence here on the bed, but we'll talk about that here in a second. Anyway, the uh, the sort of rubber band-ish, think of this as a giant spring. It's all sort of constantly flexing. See, I can, I can flex it and it springs right back into place. So I didn't like that when I first saw this printer, and now in hindsight, that's uh, for these cheap components, that's the, the, that was the better technique. So I kind of wish they were still selling this. The other problem that I was having uh, in this older videos is with these original push rods. And you can see <clears throat> these are made by having an eyelet that encompasses a uh, ball bearing. And that ball bearing has a hole drilled in it so that you can put a, a bolt through it. And um, these are made by swaging or compressing the, uh, the rim of the eyelet to sort of capture that ball bearing. And that swaging process is probably really difficult, really finicky to get right. If you over swage them, then the ball does not move. And if you under swage them, then you've got wiggle or slop or, or lash. Um, and that's what's going on here. There's again, probably 10th of a millimeter. So about uh, what? about the thickness of a sheet of paper, worth of play there, and um, that can have very large consequences when it comes to leveling the bed. Same with the play up here. So what's going on there is uh, a little bit of play ends up tilting that end effector. And so if you tilt that end effector by even just like a degree, here where the, where the sensor is sitting, way on the outside, that can lift by 0.5 millimeters. So that's a big problem. And one solution would be to move the sensor closer to the nozzle. But I've designed this sensor to sit as close to the nozzle as I can realistically get it, and um, I'm still having that problem. So we left off the last video, and I was strongly suspicious that it was that slop in the system that was causing uh, the, the inability for Marlin with the 8-bit uh, control board to uh, auto-level this bed. And that's why I moved on to these uh, magnetic ball and socket joints. And these are actually really cool. They are a zero-lash um, you know, uh, system for sure. And the way they work is there's these um, special neodymium magnets that have a conical recess in them. And I believe these were originally uh, purposed or designed to handle um, flathead screws so that you would have a flush mounted magnet for something. Uh, but anyway, they work great to kind of capture that ball bearing. Um, so that's what sits on the, you know, in these 3D printed parts and then the balls right in them. And these joints definitely removed the slop that I had with the push rods, but they might not have solved the problem with the printer because I still have that slop in my, uh, in my linear motion guides. So in theory, that I should be a whole lot better off than I was when we left off in the last video, and I could use the original uh, Marlin build with that 8-bit board, but we've already established that 8-bit board is not up to the task of running a Delta printer. So that's why I'm switching to a Duet board. And um, yeah, you guys gotta know that I love Duet boards. These are the best thing on the market. I get a lot of flack every single time 
people wanting to defend uh, Marlin and the crappier boards. Oh, Marlin runs on 32 bits now. Fine, fine. But uh, these are Wi-Fi integrated. Everything about these is flawless and seamless. They just work. And I've spent, I spent the better part of a week. That's like five to seven days of my life messing with Marlin, trying to get this printer to work. Right? And Marlin is, the way that you program it is you get into your Arduino IDE and you're using basically C++ programming language and, and, and it's really convoluted. Even if you're an expert in C++, you still have to learn how the firmware build is all set up. So it's just, you're going to waste so many days of your life if you're a newbie. Just get the one that works. Spend the extra $100 and get the board that you know will work where everything is done well. Uh, just don't waste your time, guys. Anyway, so yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm not wasting my time and I want this to work. So these orange pieces, all the orange parts here, I designed and printed up two and a half years ago and I've never tested them and they're all set up and, and I've got my BL touch sensor and in theory, uh, everything should work. So let's just um, turn this board on and watch as the BL touch pops an error and you didn't see it do anything. It didn't go through any motion. And the reason for that is the BL touch sensor is magnetic. So uh, basically the, uh, the magnetic the, 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 yeah, the, the magnetic socket here, this neodymium magnet, uh, is interfering with the, with the BL touch sensor. So I'm going to turn that off and then on again, and we'll see it do what it's supposed to do, and now it's ready to go. So basically, I need to redesign the end effector so that the magnet here is not quite so close to the BL touch, and then everything should work. Now, um, it's still not ideal because the BL touch sensor is, uh, well, it's got problems. But I've decided that, that talking about the BL Touch sensor and the solution, which is the uh, the smart effector made also by Duet, uh, that's that's that needs to be its own video. So we'll talk about just the the inherent problems with the BL Touch sensor on a Delta printer uh, in another video. But in the meantime, let's get this printer working. And in order to do that, let's take a look at the CAD drawings that I was working on, you know, two and a half, three years ago, just to figure out what I was up to. So this right here was the original starting point. Uh, I downloaded this file from Thingiverse and it really did not work. It was really difficult to print. It was a failure as a print goes and it was a failure actually on the printer as well. It didn't, it didn't really do its job. So um, using that as certain, you know, thinking about what was going on with that design led me to come up with this split cooling fan duct. And uh, when I did this, I had never seen a split cooling fan duct before and I independently developed the idea. Yeah, this was really successful for me and my channel when my channel was just a fledgling channel back then. I got a lot of people who signed up on Patreon to support my channel because they wanted access uh, to this file. And to be clear, I've never given away this file just to the to the world. Um, I don't I don't do that. It takes me many hours to come up with these with these geometries and you know they're they were the reward. I'll give any files that I've ever made to any of my five dollar Patreon supporters. So that's how these two files were given up. There's the um the mount for the BL touch. That was pretty clever. That took me quite a, a few iterations. But there's a funny story behind those uh, two bits of geometry because here you are finding them on Thingiverse. And like I said, I've never shared these with the world. Uh, these are not something that I put publicly up there. So instead, we've got this guy here who says he's designed prototype tests. So he's taken my name on Thingiverse. He calls himself Prusa Idea Man. And for those of you who know who this, the history of my channel, you'll know uh, what, what that's all about. But look at this. It says, not that moron that has a YouTube channel. <laughs> It's <laughs> just a guy who shares things. Oh, yeah, you share my work. You're giving away that, you know, you're stealing from me, basically. So whoever you are, Mr. Prusa Idea Man, design prototype test faker, I fart in your general direction. Uh, you're, you know, a piece of garbage. So there he is. He's shared two files, one of which is is mine. I don't know what this other one is. He must have stolen those from, from somebody else. And if you want to find me on Thingiverse, I am the real underscore design prototype test. This CAD drawing here is the end effector, obviously, and you can see what I was up to. I was trying to integrate the uh, the split cooling duct onto the, the effector so that it was a single print, but unfortunately this blocked a couple of the uh, the bolt heads, so you, you couldn't access those bolts. And, uh, you know, as we found out, the BL touch is mounted too close to this magnet right here. I need to move this BL touch hole cut out so that it's exactly halfway between these two magnets, and hopefully we won't get that magnetic interference. <laughs>
I'm printing these parts in ABS because of that plastic's um, you know, ability to resist deforming in hot conditions. It's the best of the three uh, easily accessible and inexpensive filaments, you know, the other two being PLA and PETG. But the problem with um, ABS is the fumes that it emits. Uh, they're pretty stinky and in fact they do contain high amounts of VOCs, volatile organic compounds. But because uh, I'm working in the same room as this print job, uh, I have my really expensive high speed uh, air filter running. The better technique for most people would just be to print inside of, a, of an enclosure. So you can just put a cardboard box over your printer. While that's printing, I'm going to work on the firmware build for the duet board. Now is a good time to talk about the push rods. So if you go on eBay or AliExpress and you search for diagonal push rod L200 magnetic, you're going to come up with uh, pretty much the same kit that I've purchased. Um, and it includes almost everything you need. You do not get any glue. So this is the glue that I used. It's just this uh, cheap two-part epoxy. You might be able to get away with some, uh, what is it, like super glue gel maybe, but uh, you're gonna need a way to precisely uh, you know, locate where the ball bearings sit. So to that end, I've made this jig and it's pretty basic. Now, uh, I set this jig to be 218 millimeters uh, in CAD, but um, PETG shrinks a little bit. That means that my rods center to center on the pivot points actually measure 217.1 uh, millimeters after it's all said and done. But what, what's critical here is that all of the rods are matching. So that is the case, and that means that as long as I know the length and they all match perfectly, uh, everything should work quite well. So my kit uh, came with uh, all the magnets that I needed, 12 of them, and unfortunately, I let two of the magnets snap together and that shattered them. You can see it just <laughs> I had a bunch of chunks of magnet which wouldn't work, and so I had to order new uh, replacement magnets, and it took a while for those to come in the mail, and when they finally arrived, I noticed that they were bigger, thicker, I should say, than the, uh, than the magnets which came uh, in the kit originally. And that was slightly problematic because the thicker magnets are much more powerful and well powerful is good because it means you don't accidentally um, you know pop the the magnets out of joint or pop the the, the ball bearings out of joint but uh, the more powerful magnets were still interfering with the BL touch sensor and you can see the sensor is functioning perfectly right now because what I've done is I put my remaining weaker thinner magnets here in the end effector and it works. The physical build of the printer is now complete and that includes wiring up the Duet 2 Wi-Fi board, uh, the control board, into the printer itself. So um, a couple of things that I should tell you about this particular uh, control board. First of all, it's really old. I think it's almost three years old and it's running firmware version 1.2. The current version is 3.0, so uh, that needs to be updated. Um, I pulled this board out of my Tevo Little Monster, which is another Delta style 3D printer. And that means that without doing any uh, updating or changing the firmware at all, I'm actually getting some functionality out of it uh, just the way it is. Using It thinks it's in the, 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 the little monster still. So let me show you what I'm talking about. We can home the printer. Uh, we can drop it down to a lower, closer to the bed level. Oh, I homed it again accidentally. <laughs> There we go. See, I can move the ender effector around. And most importantly, I can run a G30 command, which is probe in place. And that will uh, test the functionality of the BL touch sensor. And as you can see, it's working perfectly. So all I have left to do is, uh, you know, sort of do some fine adjustments on the, uh, the software, on the firmware. And this should be a fully functional printer. So keep your fingers crossed. Let's jump on the computer and make those software edits happen and then we can run a test print. Let's flog a dead horse because so many people don't believe that the horse is in fact deceased. What you're looking at here is the Arduino IDE and this is the environment where you are meant to do your configurating or configuration of uh, any build of Marlin firmware. So um, if we scroll down here in the conf we're in the configuration.h uh, you know tab by the way. So if we scroll way down here past all this programming language, this is all C++ stuff. Um, and we scroll down to I think we'll find delta configuration. I don't know. It's somewhere down here, but it's so hard to find too. So we're looking for a header that looks like that. So that's movement settings. Uh, 
Delta settings, there we go. So here's where you're meant to uh, define the things about your printer that are, are required to change. But so many of these things um, are backend stuff that a normal user should never touch. What is this delta feed rate scaling, for instance? Um, you know, and if you put a period, like if you accidentally put a period at the end of that, now you've just messed up your whole firmware build. It's all messed up. It, it won't work. There are ways to debug it, but as a newbie, if you're not familiar with the Arduino uh, programming environment, uh, you wouldn't know how to debug that. And it's just, it's so convoluted. So basically Marlin is meant to be a thing that you receive from the factory and you don't modify it. It's not user friendly. It's not for you to touch. Contrast that with uh, RepRap firmware running on the Duet uh, control board. So this is the uh, web interface running on my web browser. And here we can see I can control the printer wirelessly. I can home it and do all those things you saw me doing on the tablet. But if I go to the settings tab here on the left, I can also click this button here and upload Files, so I never need to look at any programming language. I certainly am never gonna see the uh, back end of the firmware, but if I really wanna get into the nuts and bolts of my of my particular configuration, I can click here and get into config.g and modify it here. So this starts to look a little bit more like a programming language, but in fact, this is all G-code. So M569, that's a G-code command. So there, there's the sort of back end you can, the power user you know, interface, and you can really modify it after the fact. But we're gonna do it in the easy way today. We're gonna use the RepRap firmware online configuration tool, and we're just gonna go through the tabs here. And when we get to the end, uh, we're gonna download the, um, the full firmware configuration, as well as clicking these two links here to download the latest version of the firmware. And then we're also going to update the web interface. So this is gonna be changed around a bit as well. What you're watching is the procedure for updating any of the more recent uh, Duet control boards. But because my control board was just so ancient, uh, I had to follow the Duet Duzuki here, uh, installing and updating firmware, and then fallback procedure number one is actually what worked for me. And this is the result, the new web interface, which is such an improvement. I didn't think that they could improve the old interface, but this is definitely better. So starting here with the uh, with the dashboard, that's where you can do everything like home the printer and move the axes, things like that. Um, down here in system, this is where it really gets good. We're looking at config.g. So that um, upload system files is right there, that, that button that we were pressing before. So that's if you just wanna do things without getting into the nitty gritty. But here you can click on the edit via config tool and it just pops up automatically uh, your current firmware settings in the uh, online configuration uh, tool. How great is that? So you don't ever actually have to uh, go here into config.g and mess with the G code commands yourself. If this is a little daunting, like what is what does the uh, I zero mean here in the in the M one oh six commit? Actually, that that inverts the fan for for anybody who cares. But you know, if you don't want to memorize what all of these functions do after which specific command, like what is M five sixty nine? Well, it tells you here in the in the comments uh, what that is. You can also do this here. You can click up there to the G code reference on the top right. And you know, you could look up 569. It's going to be down here somewhere. Three, four, five, M569. There we go. Set motor drive direction, enable polarity, and step pulse timing. So there's your reference sheet, which also there's a convenient link to right there, uh, you know, in the G code as you're, as you're modifying. So uh, everything got even more user-friendly, just phenomenal stuff. How can anybody still be using the other operating systems these days? Now, it is cool to have you know a, an ecosystem with you know a diverse ecosystem. So Clipper and Marlin exist and that's a good thing, but uh, this is for sure the winner. And I don't know why this isn't the dominant uh, you know program, except that uh, you know, most printers come with Marlin and people just stick with what they with what they have. So, but this is absolutely the best way to do it. The Duet control board has two ways of compensating for physical inaccuracies uh, in the 3D printer. And if you check out this right up here on the Duet Dozuki, you can learn about both of those. But basically the G32 command um, compensates for inaccuracies of the frame. So it uses software to basically measure uh, w where the frame sits and then to adjust itself as it's printing. The second command is a G29 command, and we're all used to this command, we've seen it before. That's your mesh bed leveling algorithm. So let's um, run the G32 command first, and you can run them both, one on top of the other, to just get phenomenal accuracy on your first layer. So here in the console, 
we can just type in G32. And what this does is it auto homes the printer and then using that reference, it takes a measurement on a polar grid of points. So 13 points in all is what I have it set up to do here. And after it's taken those measurements, you wanna run the G32 command again. So you can see here, I've run it four times in total. The first time, the deviation was 2.931, and then afterwards it was a deviation of 0.54. But every time you sort of run it through the wash again, you get more and more accurate results. And my final results here were 0.44 before and 0.44 after. So running the G32 command again is not going to make my printer any more accurate. Now all I need to do is run a G29 command and I'm ready to print. After the G29 command has run its course, you can click on the height map menu item and see a graphical representation of the inaccuracies of the bed. So I have no idea what's going on with my bed. It's definitely, uh, something's not right. I don't know why there's ridges, uh, you know, at each of the points. So something funky with the, uh, with the joints or something on the printer, but I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe it's not too bad. Maybe I can still uh, get a print to stick somehow to that, to that bed. So let's give it a try. Is it working? Yeah. yeah, it's working. Taking a look here, we can see the, the lines here at the front edge aren't quite touching. And that means that uh, I could be calibrated a little bit closer to the bed there. But it's the opposite story up here where we're getting a little bit too much, uh, too close. So um, yeah, basically, even with all the fanciness in the Duet firmware, I still can't quite make up for all the funkiness in this frame. Just to give you an idea how fast this thing prints, that is real time. Um, yeah, this is not sped up footage, so it's uh, it's quite rapid. I think you need to go at these fast speeds to really maximize the use out of the, um, what is that, the E3D Volcano. Uh, printing any slower, you just get artifacts, but at this speed, it works quite well. So let's take a look at the, uh, the test cube. We can see there's no rippling or ghosting coming out of this machine, even though it's printing at that extremely high speed. So pretty awesome. I am getting some under extrusion. It looks like you can see through the top there and the bridging is pretty terrible as well as uh, that bit of funkiness right there. And that's coming from a lack of part cooling. There we have it. Magnetic joints plus duet for the win. The reason I can't do part cooling is because this fan back here is busted. Uh, now I broke it like that trying to get in there to see if I could fix it, but for some reason it just stopped working. In the last two and a half years, something must have corroded or something in there. Uh, so I've got a new one on order, but in coronavirus times, who knows how long it's gonna take for that to come from China. The machine is working and it's printing quite rapidly. That's a um, hundred millimeters per second uh, print speed with 2000 millimeters per second squared acceleration. So uh, I'm gonna call the project a complete success, but there's a couple of caveats. So I changed two variables, right? I changed the joints from the uh, eyelets to these magnetic joints, but I also changed the firmware and control board. So which of those two variables is responsible for successful printing? I'm gonna go with the control board. And the reason I'm saying that is because even uh, with the new control board that has that G32 uh, functionality and command, uh, the G code command, it's still having the same problem that it had before, where it prints too close to the bed here on the edge closer to me and too far off the bed uh, there on, on the far edge. So um, with Marlin, it was just way more extreme. With, with this one, I'm, I would say I'm about 0.1 millimeters too close here and 0.1 millimeters too far on the far side. So that's a total distance or, or, or difference between the two of 0.2 millimeters. With Marlin, it was more like 0.5 to, gosh, almost one millimeter. Um, so it was like grinding along this edge of the bed and along that edge of the bed, it was floating up in the air. And I still don't know what's causing that, uh, you know, inaccuracy. It could be a crooked frame. These plastic joints here are pretty suspect. And in fact, there are kits that you can buy uh, with metal joints. Um, but it also could be the lash, the wiggle that I'm getting out of the, um, the bearing blocks on the linear motion guides. Uh, yeah. Project's done. It's a good one. Thanks for watching. See you next time.